Good morning and welcome to All Saints. My name's Jill and David and I would like to extend a warm welcome to you whether you're watching locally or from afar. We're looking forward to worshipping with you this morning. And today's really exciting because we're starting a thematic series which is based on part of the prophet Micah where Micah speaks to God's people, challenges them in terms of their worship and calls them to act justly, to love mercy and walk humbly with their God. And as we contemplate what it means to live in our world, we're aware that those deep biblical values resonate and speak to us powerfully in our own day in a needy world. And we're therefore reminded that we have the joy of worshipping a God who is faithful, whose character is unending. And so therefore, as we look towards that, we're going to have an overview of the book of Micah a little bit later on. We're going to start, though, be reminding how God is faithful through all of history, from the beginning of time through today to the end of time, as we sing together all through history. So we've sung of how God has been faithful through all of history, but we're aware as we sing that of the reality is so often we're not faithful. So can I uh, invite you to pause for a moment um, and just to reflect on the week past of how maybe we haven't heeded that call to be faithful, to live holy lives, 
as God calls us to. So we're now going to come and confess to God, to ask for his forgiveness, aware that he is merciful and just. So Father, when our worship has been more about us than about you, Lord, Lord, have have mercy. mercy. When we have ignored the pain of your broken body on earth, Christ, Christ, have have mercy. mercy. When our services have been more of an escape for us than good news for the poor, Lord, Lord, have have mercy. mercy. When we praise you with our lips, but we deny you with our finances, Christ, have have mercy. mercy. When our instruments are louder than our cries for justice, Lord, Lord, have have mercy. mercy. When we fail to learn from the sacrificial worship of our brothers and sisters across the world, Christ, Christ, have have mercy. mercy. And so may the almighty and merciful Lord grant us pardon and forgiveness of all our sins, time for amendment of life, and the grace and strength of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And so can I invite us to come together as Christ's forgiven people. Risen Christ, faithful shepherd of your father's sheep, teach us to hear your voice and to follow your command that all your people may be gathered into one flock to the glory of God the Father. Amen. As I said at the outset, we're starting a thematic series today, thinking particularly based on Micah chapter 6, verse 8. And over the subsequent weeks, we're going to be thinking about those themes of justice and mercy and walking humbly with God. Those are great biblical themes that occur throughout Scripture. We could pick up some of them almost for any of the prophets and also many of the New Testament books as we think about Jesus' own teaching, his challenge to the Pharisees, as the instructions that, for example, come in the book of James of living out our faith. But it's amazing how Micah speaks of issues that affect us in our contemporary day. And to give us a bit of an overview, therefore, of the whole book, we're going to watch now this really helpful overview of Micah from the Bible Project before Pauline comes to read to us from the particular section of Micah that we're going to be focusing on today. The book of the prophet Micah. Micah lived in a small town named Moreshet in the southern kingdom of Judah, about the same time as Isaiah. And both the northern and southern kingdoms of Israel had split long ago, and both had been violating their covenant with the God of Israel. So Micah warned that God would bring the big bad empire of Assyria to take out the northern kingdom and come ravage Jerusalem. And he also warned that after them, Babylon would bring an even greater destruction. Like all the prophets, Micah spoke on God's behalf to accuse Israel, or as he puts it in chapter 3, I am filled with strength, with the spirit of God, with justice and power to declare how Israel has rebelled. And so, most of this book explores Micah's accusations and his warnings of God's judgment on Israel. But Micah also had a message of hope that countered these warnings about the restoration God would bring on the other side of his judgment. And if you dive into the book with us, you'll see how this works. So the first two sections of the book develop Micah's accusations and warnings against Israel and its leaders. So part one opens with the poetic description of God appearing over Israel, just like he did at Mount Sinai. There's fire and smoke and earthquake, but he hasn't come to make a covenant this time. He's come to bring his judgment on Israel for over 500 years of rebellion. Micah goes on to name all of these towns and cities in Israel that are the culprits of all of this rebellion, God's coming for them. 
But why exactly? So Micah picks a fight with Israel's leaders. He says that they've become wealthy through theft and greed. He alludes to the story of Ahab stealing a family vineyard from Naboth in 1 Kings chapter 21. But also it's because Israel's prophets are corrupt. They're quite happy to offer promises of God's protection to anyone who can afford to pay them. No, Micah says, God has withdrawn his protection from Israel. In the second section of Accusations, Micah describes even more how Israel's leaders and prophets have together committed grave injustice. They run the land through bribery, they bend justice to favor the wealthy, and the poor are deprived of their land, their security, and their hope. And all of this is a violation of the laws of the Torah, which declare it illegal to sell land that belongs to families, even if they're poor. And so we find out that God's judgment is going to take the form of an oppressive nation that comes to take out the northern kingdom and Jerusalem and its temple, which will be reduced to ruins. Now these are very stiff warnings, and they're not the final word. Each of these warning sections is concluded with a striking promise of hope. So first is a poem about how God is like a shepherd who's going to rescue and regather his flock, which is the remnant of his people, and he's going to bring them all back to good pasture and become their king once more. The second warning section is concluded by picking up this image of the ruined Jerusalem temple. And Micah says this won't be permanent. One day God is going to exalt his temple. He's going to fill it with his presence and fill the city with the remnant of his people. And so God's purpose is to make Israel the meeting place of heaven and earth so that all nations will stream to Jerusalem where God becomes the king of all the nations bringing peace to the earth. Now these two concluding poems of hope, they're very powerful. And the next section of the book actually develops them further in a beautifully designed series of poems that are entirely about the future hope of Israel and the nations. So we learn that after the Assyrian attack, Israel will be conquered and exiled to Babylon. But from there, God will restore his people and bring them back to their land. And then we learn that in the new Jerusalem, a new messianic king from the line of David will come. He'll be born in Bethlehem and then rule in Jerusalem over the restored people of God. Finally, in this messianic kingdom of God, the faithful remnant of God's people will become that blessing among the nations. But at the same time, God will bring his final justice and remove evil from his world. The final section of the book returns to this pattern of warning followed by hope that we saw in the first parts of the book. So Micah exposes again the unjust economic practices of Israel's leaders and how it's destroying the land and its people. And here Micah offers his famous words that summarize what it means for Israel to follow their God. He has told you, O human, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. This is exactly what Israel has not been doing, and so they will come to ruin. However, the book ends with another powerful note of hope. Israel is personified as an individual who's sitting alone in shame and defeat. It's a clear image of Israel's destruction and exile. And this individual is watching for God's mercy, and he begs God to listen and forgive. But why? Why should God listen to and forgive this faithless and rebellious people? Well, the poet offers two reasons. First, he says, because of God's character. Who is a God like you who forgives sin and pardons rebellion? He knows that God's mercy is more powerful than his anger or his judgment. And the second reason is because of God's promises. He says, you will stay true to Jacob and show covenant love to Abraham as you swore so long ago. Now these are the final words of the book. They're an allusion to God's covenant promises to Abraham and his family all the way back in the book of Genesis, that all nations would find God's blessing through Abraham's family. But to become a blessing to the nations, Israel must first be faithful to their God. And so this explains this back and forth between judgment and hope in the book of Micah. If God's going to bless the nations through Israel, then he must confront and judge the evil among his people. But his judgment is what leads to hope. Because God's covenant love and promise are more powerful than human evil, and his ultimate purpose is not to destroy, it's to save and redeem. Or as the concluding lines of the book put it, 
God delights in covenant love, so he will again show compassion. He will trample our evil. He will toss our sins into the depth of the sea. And that's what the book of Micah is all about. Our reading is from the book of Micah, chapter 6. The Lord's case against Israel. Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up, plead your case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, O mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam. My people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, counseled and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? He has showed you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Israel's Guilt and Punishment Listen, the Lord is calling to the city, and to fear your name is wisdom. Heed the rod and the one who appointed it. Am I still to forget, O wicked house, your ill-gotten treasures and the short ephah which is accursed? Shall I acquit a man with dishonest scales, with a bag of false weights? Her rich men are violent. Her people are liars, and their tongues speak deceitfully. Therefore, I have begun to destroy you, to ruin you because of your sins. You will eat but not be satisfied. Your stomach will still be empty. You will store up but save nothing, because what you save I will give to the sword. You will plant, but not harvest. You will press olives, but not use the oil on yourselves. You will crush grapes, but not drink the wine. You have observed the statutes of Omri and all the practices of Ahab's house, and you have followed their traditions. Therefore, I will give you over to ruin and your people to derision. You will bear the scorn of the nations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, Pauline, thanks for that reading. Uh, let's pray. Uh, Lord, we ask that through the pages of Scripture, you would speak uh, to our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. I wonder what it is as you look back on this week that maybe has really struck you that you've seen on the news. There's been some big things, hasn't there? There's been the uh, resolution of the case in terms of George Floyd, terrible things about racism on our news, questions of probity in office, how money's actually been spent in news, for example, in sport, and also things such as the COVID crisis that's going on and particularly the impact on uh, places like India. 
And therefore, as we watch maybe that passage uh, from that overview from the Bible Project, I guess if you're anything like me, you were just struck about how relevant those issues are that are spoken to Israel in its day in terms of those underlying values that also impact us today. Deep questions of justice that maybe we could look out on our world and ask the question, why is it that things don't actually get better? Why is it they seem to stay the same? If we maybe looked at the news, we hear time and time again of we need to act or we need to make things better. But yet as we look at Micah and as we reflect on maybe the underlying values from something that was written the best part of 2,800 years ago or so, we're reminded that there's something deep in terms of human nature that doesn't seem to need to change. In each generation, we'd be able to go back and talk to our forebears about issues about society, of how they're aware of how things just aren't quite right. Isn't it interesting how the record just doesn't seem to change? And it's very much that reason why we're having this little thematic series that I spoke about earlier that we're using on some of those themes, particularly from Micah chapter 6, verse 8 that we heard. Act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. And the underlying premise of that is that as human beings, if we haven't been able to sort things out in the past, we actually need a deep transformation. We need to look to God and his values of justice and mercy and walking humbly, which may be very different to what the world speaks for the simple reason of the world hasn't delivered on its solutions. Maybe over lunch when you're at home, you might want to reflect, read a bit more of Micah and almost think about what are the charges that you would bring in our day? What does it look like to contextualise it to our culture and our particular time? Because I'd suggest, although we can't read the things directly, they each bear a testament to human character and the falling short of human character which are sadly just as true in our own day as they were in Micah's. Micah chapter 6 as was read to us just now we find a series of charges brought against God's people. It reads doesn't it I'd suggest a bit like a doctor sitting down with their patient. It's a challenging but yet also a friendly chat saying if you carry on like this these are the things that are going to happen these are the things that need to be addressed in your lifestyle and your diet and your living for those whom Micah is speaking to there's an issue that deeply lies at the heart of their worship in verse 6 it says this With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? And of course, in their day, the burnt offering was the most sizable thing that someone could bring because all of it was burnt up. There was no food that would be taken away that could then be subsequently consumed. It was a giving of something tangibly in totality. But yet, as God speaks to his people through Micah, He's telling them that actually, as we find elsewhere (laughs) with the prophets, that it's not just about the cultic acts of worship, because they've acted with no regard to the poor in chapter 2, that they've not addressed issues of power in chapter 3, that there's something wrong about their desires. This is brought starkly in the second half in verses 9 through to 16. Verse 10, it speaks of their ill-gotten gains. That they've traded fraudulently in verse 11 in terms of the use of manipulating weights. That there has been violence of deceit in verse 12. In a sense, in this chat, as God talks to his people, they're being told of the reality of exile that's going to come, of judgment falling upon the people. For us in this series, we therefore, using the full sweep of scripture where there's so much more, we want to focus therefore on what does the charge look like for us? The charge that they're given 
as the inadequacy of the burnt offerings which they bring is described is in verse 8 that this is what the Lord requires of you to act justly to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God if we were to go and talk to our world I suspect there are some of those values that people would like to act justly to love mercy maybe less so to walk humbly with God the call for us as Christians in exactly the same way as it was for in Micah's day is to reflect on what does the Bible tell us that biblical justice is what does it mean to understand biblical mercy and what does it mean to walk humbly with our God we need to do all of them together to be reshaped and refined by God in terms of our motives this is our true path of discipleship this is an invitation for us in our own day to heed the character of God and to turn towards him but where is the hope is this all simply about doing well of course in Micah's day this is something where the backdrop looks grim but there is of course a parallel passage in that Bible uh, project thing it's spoken of Israel in a sense of suffering there's a parallel passage to this written against the same backdrop in similar words from the prophet Isaiah but the passage in Isaiah follows on with Isaiah 52 and 53 those great passages that speak of the suffering servant that the hope and restoration of Israel will not be based in just what they do but rather in God himself who will come as a suffering servant as the Lord Jesus so therefore as we embark over these next few weeks hearing what it is that Micah speaks to us today as it illuminates something of the character of God that we need to heed in our own day as we consider the contemporary challenges of what it means to act justly to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God our prayer is that our eyes will be focused on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith who goes before us and dies for us and gives us hope but through the indwelling of his spirit will shape us and refine us so I invite you as we go in these weeks ahead what does it mean for us to act justly to love mercy and walk humbly with our God will we have the zeal and the impatience that that verse calls us to have as we worship God not merely with what we do together or separately on a Sunday but crucially with all of our lives that is our vocation as his people are you ready to come and surrender and see where he will lead us we're going to respond now in song as I invite you to make that call and that challenge a prayer as we sing purify my heart Ready to
Heavenly Father, we bring to you our prayers and petitions in the sure knowledge that you hear our prayers and answer them. You are our faithful Father and we put our trust in you. Thank you, faithful Father, for the hope we see around us, for the signs of normality beginning to edge ever closer. We pray, though, that as a society we will be able to live in a brighter, better future that the compassion that has been shown over the last year or so wouldn't dwindle away, that the way in which people have loved their neighbour would continue, and that respect for all, especially the marginalised, would abound. Ultimately, we pray that people would see the world through your loving eyes. We thank you, Lord, for the success of the vaccine, particularly in our community. It provides people with reassurance as well as hope. We pray, though for parts of our world where they are not yet at this stage and when the virus sp still spreads. Thank you for the dedication of scientists and those working to find out more about how to control coronavirus and to help us to return to a better way of life. Lord, as the sun shines and summer approaches, we pray for the plans that the Church has to bring your word to the people of Sidmouth. Help the leaders of the Sid Valley Mission community to earnestly seek your will, learn from the past year, and help to revitalise and renew us as the Church that is the Body of Christ. As people plan how things like holiday clubs might happen and in what format, would you equip people and prepare the soil for the sowing of the seed that is your gospel message. Father, we lift to you those who are vulnerable in our society. 
we pray for those who are lonely and isolated at this time. That you would put people on our, our hearts to contact or visit, if only to check in on them. We pray for those who are anxious, worried or even scared. Bring them peace and help us to bring your healing love. We especially pray for young people who are struggling with their mental health. Give them hope, strength and positives in each day. We also pray for those we know and love who are ill physically. Bring your healing power through your spirit, Lord. We ask all these things and all of our prayers in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. And now, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. Isn't it? Um, 
You're right. I'll carry on. Isn't it amazing to be reminded that Jesus truly is God's righteousness revealed? And as we seek to reflect uh, on what it means for us to live out those characteristics, that call that we've heard from Micah today, we can do no worse than look to the person of Jesus who acts as our example. Uh, in terms of our notices this week, we're also looking to the future as we have uh, our APCM on Tuesday uh, and we'd really love you to uh, invite you to join us uh, on Zoom or if that's not possible in person. Um, it will be slightly shorter uh, than normal, but it's a great opportunity to share together, but also to be looking forward uh, to be praying for the future of our church as we seek uh, to live out what it means to be Jesus' disciples. Uh, do please pay attention to the other notices and things and just be praying for the life of our church together. Uh, there's a lot going on this week, this past week. Um, our team have just started in terms of the work with TLG and the local primary school. So it'd be good to be praying for them in a sense, so expression uh, of what it means uh, to love justice uh, and mercy as we seek to minister to people in our wider community. But as we come towards the end of our service, we're reminded that it's the Lord Jesus who's called to be our vision. Uh, the one who shapes us and changes us, who refines our motivations and our values. And so therefore we're going to sing a great hymn of praise to conclude, Be Thou My Vision.
And so as we go, let's say a final prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will help us this week to heed your call, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you, our God. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.